Next day, by dint of a persistence that many thought ill-advised, Rio persuaded the authorities to convene a health committee at the prefect's office. People in town are getting nervous. That's a fact, Dr. Richard admitted. And of course, all sorts of wild rumours are going round. The prefect said to me, Take prompt action if you like, but don't attract attention. He, personally, is convinced that it's a false alarm. Rio gave Castel a lift to the prefect's office. Do you know, Castel said, when they were in the car, that we haven't a gram of serum in the whole district? I know. I rang up the depot. The director seemed quite startled. It'll have to be sent from Paris. Let's hope they're quick about it. I sent a wire yesterday, Rio said. The prefect greeted them amiably enough, but one could see his nerves were on edge. Let's make a start, gentlemen, he said. Need I review the situation? Richard thought that wasn't necessary. He and his colleagues were acquainted with the facts. The only question was what measures should be adopted. The question, old Castell cut in almost rudely, is to know whether it's plague or not. Two or three of the doctors present protested. The others seemed to hesitate. The prefect gave a start and hurriedly glanced toward the door to make sure it had prevented this outrageous remark from being overheard in the corridor. Richard said that in his opinion the great thing was not to take an alarmist view. All that could be said at present was that we had to deal with a special type of fever with inguinal complications. In medical science, as in daily life, it was unwise to jump to conclusions. Old Castell, who was placidly chewing his draggled yellow moustache, raised his pale bright eyes and gazed at Rieu. Then, after sweeping the other members of the committee with a friendly glance, he said that he knew quite well that it was plague, and needless to say, he also knew that were this to be officially admitted, the authorities would be compelled to take very drastic steps. This was, of course, the explanation of his colleagues' reluctance to face the facts, and, if it would ease their minds, he was quite prepared to say it wasn't plague. The prefect seemed ruffled and remarked that, in any case, this line of argument seemed to him unsound. The important thing, Castell replied, isn't the soundness or otherwise of the argument, but for it to make you think. Rieu, who had said nothing so far, was asked for his opinion. We are dealing, he said, with the fever of a typhoidal nature, accompanied by vomiting and buboes. I have incised these buboes and had the pus analysed. Our laboratory analyst believes he has identified the plague bacillus but I am bound to add that there are specific modifications that don't quite tally with the classical description of the plague bacillus. Richard pointed out that this justified a policy of wait and see. Anyhow, it would be wise to await the statistical report on the series of analyses that had been going on for several days. When a microbe, Rio said, after a short intermission, can quadruple in three days' time, the volume of the spleen can swell the mesenteric ganglia to the size of an orange and give them the consistency of gruel. A policy of wait and see is, to say the least of it, unwise. The foci of infection are steadily extending. Judging by the rapidity with which the disease is spreading, it may well, unless we can stop it, kill off half the town before two months are out. That being so, it has small importance whether you call it plague or some rare kind of fever. The important thing is to prevent its killing off half the population of this town. Richard said it was a mistake to paint too gloomy a picture, and moreover, the disease hadn't been proved to be contagious. Indeed, relatives of his patients living under the same roof had escaped it. But others have died, Rio observed. And obviously, contagion is never absolute. Otherwise, you'd have a constant mathematical progression and the death rate would rock it up catastrophically. It's not a question of painting too black a picture. It's a question of taking precautions. Richard, however, 
summing up the situation as he saw it, pointed out that if the epidemic did not cease spontaneously, it would be necessary to apply the rigorous prophylactic measures laid down in the code. And to do this, it would be necessary to admit officially that plague had broken out. But of this, there was no absolute certainty. Therefore, any hasty action was to be deprecated. Ryu stuck to his guns. The point isn't whether the measures provided for in the code are rigorous, but whether they are needful to prevent the death of half the population. All the rest is a matter of administrative action, and I needn't remind you that our Constitution has provided for such emergencies by empowering prefects to issue the necessary orders. Quite true, the prefect assented but I shall need your professional declaration that the epidemic is one of plague. If we don't make that declaration, Ryu said, there's a risk that half the population may be wiped out. Richard cut in with some impatience. The truth is that our colleague is convinced it's plague. His description of the syndrome proved it. Ryu replied that he had not described a syndrome, but merely what he'd seen with his own eyes and what he'd seen was buboes and high fever accompanied by delirium, ending fatally within 48 hours. Could Dr. Richard take the responsibility of declaring that the epidemic would die out without the imposition of rigorous prophylactic measures? Richard hesitated, then fixed his eyes on Rio. Please answer me, quite frankly. Are you absolutely convinced it's plague? You're stating the problem wrongly. It's not a question of the term I use, it's a question of time. Your view, I take it, the prefect put in, is this. Even if it isn't plague, the prophylactic measures enjoined by law for coping with a state of plague should be put into force immediately. If you insist on my having a view, that conveys it accurately enough. The doctors confabulated. Richard was their spokesman. It comes to this. We are to take the responsibility of acting as though the epidemic were plague. This way of putting it met with general approval. It doesn't matter to me, Ryu said, how you phrase it. My point is that we should not act as if there were no likelihood that half the population would be wiped out, for then it would be. Followed by scowls and protestations, Ryu left the committee room. Some minutes later, as he was driving down a back street, redolent of fried fish and urine, a woman screaming in agony, her groin dripping blood, stretched out her arms toward him. On the day after the committee meeting, the fever notched another small advance. It even found its way into the papers, but discreetly. Only a few brief references to it were made. On the following day, however, Ryu observed that small official notices had been just put up about the town, though in places where they would not attract much attention. It was hard to find in these notices any indication that the authorities were facing the situation squarely. The measures enjoined were far from draconian, and one had the feeling that many concessions had been made to a desire not to alarm the public. The instructions began with a bald statement that a few cases of a malignant fever had been reported in Iran. It was not possible as yet to say if this fever was contagious. The symptoms were not so marked as to be really perturbing, and the authorities felt sure they could rely on the townspeople to treat the situation with composure. Nonetheless, guided by a spirit of prudence that all would appreciate, the prefect was putting into force some precautionary measures. If these measures were carefully studied and properly applied, they would obviate any risk of an epidemic. This being so, the prefect felt no doubt that everybody in his jurisdiction would wholeheartedly second his personal efforts. The notice outlined the general programme that the authorities had drawn up. It included a systematic extermination of the rat population by injecting poison gas into the sewers and a strict supervision of the water supply. The townspeople were advised to practice extreme cleanliness, and any who found fleas on their person were directed to call at the municipal dispensaries. Also, heads of households were ordered promptly to report any fever case diagnosed by their doctors 
and to permit the isolation of sick members of their families in special wards at the hospital. These wards, it was explained, were equipped to provide patients with immediate treatment and ensure the maximum prospect of recovery. Some supplementary regulations enjoined compulsory disinfection of the sick room and of the vehicle in which the patient travelled. For the rest, the prefect confined himself to advising all who had been in contact with the patient to consult the sanitary inspector and strictly to follow his advice. Dr. Rio swung round brusquely from the poster and started back to his surgery. Grand, who was awaiting him there, raised his arms dramatically when the doctor entered. Yes, Rio said, I know, the figures are rising. On the previous day, ten deaths had been reported. The doctor told Grand that he might be seeing him in the evening, as he had promised to visit Cotard. An excellent idea, Grand said. You'll do him good. As a matter of fact, I find him greatly changed. In what way? He's become amiable. Wasn't he amiable before? Grand seemed at a loss. He couldn't say that Cotard used to be unamiable. The term wouldn't have been correct. But Cotard was a silent, secretive man, with something about him that made Grand think of a wild boar. His bedroom, meals at a cheap restaurant, some rather mysterious comings and goings. These were the sum of Cotard's days. He described himself as a travelling salesman in wines and spirits. Now and then he was visited by two or three men, presumably customers. Sometimes in the evening he would go to a movie across the way. In this connection, Grand mentioned a detail he had noticed, that Cotard seemed to have a preference for gangster films. But the thing that had struck him most about the man was his aloofness, not to say his mistrust of everyone he met. And now, so Grand said, there had been a complete change. I don't quite know how to put it, but I must say I've an impression that he is trying to make himself agreeable to all and sundry, to be in everybody's good books. Nowadays he often talks to me, he suggests we should go out together, and I can't bring myself to refuse. What's more, he interests me, and of course I saved his life. Since his attempt at suicide, Cotard had had no more visitors. In the streets, in shops, he was always trying to strike up friendships. To the grocer, he was all affability. No one could take more pains than he to show his interest in the tobacconist's gossip. This particular tobacconist, a woman, by the way, Grand explained, is a holy terror. I told Cotard so, but he replied that I was prejudiced and she had plenty of good points. Only one had to find them out. On two or three occasions, Cotard had invited Grand to come with him to the luxury restaurants and cafes of the town which he had recently taken to patronising. There's a pleasant atmosphere in them, he explained, and then one's in good company. Grand noticed that the staff made much of Cotard, and he soon discovered why, when he saw the lavish tips his companion gave. The travelling salesman seemed greatly to appreciate the amiability shown him in return for his largesse. One day, when the head waiter had escorted him to the door and helped him into his overcoat, Cotard said to Grand, He's a nice fellow, and he'd make a good witness. A witness? I don't follow. Cotard hesitated before answering. Well, he could say I'm not really a bad kind of man. But his humour had its ups and downs. One day, when the grossier had shown less affability, he came home in a tearing rage. He's sitting with the others, the swine. With what others? The whole damned lot of them. Grand had personally witnessed an odd scene that took place at the tobacconists. An animated conversation was in progress, and the woman behind the counter started airing her views about a murder case that had created some stir in Algiers. A young commercial employee had killed an Algerian on a beach. I always say the woman began. If they clapped all that scum in jail, decent folks could breathe more freely. She was too much startled by Cotard's reaction. He dashed out of the shop without a word of excuse to continue. Grand and the woman gazed after him, dumbfounded.
Subsequently, Grand reported to the Doctor other changes in Cotard's character. Cotard had always professed very liberal ideas, as his pet dictum on economic questions, Big Fish Eat Little Fish, implied. But now, the only Oran newspaper he bought was the conservative organ, and one could hardly help suspecting that he made a point of reading it in public places. Somewhat of the same order was a request he made to Grand shortly before he left his sickbed. Grand mentioned he was going to the post office, and Cotard asked him to be kind enough to dispatch a money order for a hundred francs to a sister living at a distance, mentioning that he sent her this sum every month. Then, just when Grand was leaving the room, he called him back. No, send her two hundred francs. That'll be a nice surprise for her. She believes I never give her a thought, but actually I'm devoted to her. Not long after this, he made some curious remarks to Grand in the course of conversation. He had badgered Grand into telling him about the somewhat mysterious private work to which Grand gave his evenings. I know, Cotard exclaimed. You're writing a book, aren't you? Something of the kind, but it's not so simple as that. Ah, Cotard sighed. I only wish I had a knack for writing. When Grand showed his surprise, Cotard explained with some embarrassment that being a literary man must make things easier in lots of ways. Why? Grand asked. Why? Because an author has more rights than ordinary people. As everybody knows, people will stand much more from him. It looks, said Rio to Grand on the morning when the official notices were posted, as if this business of the rats had addled his brain as it has done for so many other people. That's all it is. Or perhaps he's scared of the fever. I doubt it, Doctor. If you want to know my opinion, he... He paused. With the machine gun rattle from its exhaust, the deritization van was clattering by. Ryu kept silent until it was possible to make himself audible, then asked, without much interest, what Grand's opinion was. He's a man with something pretty serious on his conscience, Grand said gravely. The doctor shrugged his shoulders. As the inspector had said, he'd other fish to fry. That afternoon, Rieu had another talk with Castel. The serum had not yet come. In any case, Rieu said, I wonder if it will be much use. This bacillus is such a queer one. There, Castel said, I don't agree with you. These little brutes always have an air of originality, but at bottom, it's always the same thing. That's your theory, anyhow. Actually, of course, we know next to nothing on the subject. I grant you, it's only my theory. Still, in a sense, that goes for everybody. Throughout the day, the doctor was conscious that the slightly dazed feeling that came over him whenever he thought about the plague was growing more pronounced. Finally, he realized that he was afraid. On two occasions, he entered crowded cafes. Like Cotard, he felt a need for friendly contacts, human warmth. A stupid instinct, Rio told himself. Still, it served to remind him that he'd promised to visit the traveling salesman. Cotard was standing beside the dining table when the doctor entered his room that evening. A detective story lay open on the tablecloth but the night was closing in and it would have been difficult to read in the growing darkness. Most likely Cotard had been sitting musing in the twilight until he heard the ring at his door. Ria asked how he was feeling. Cotard sat down and replied rather grumpily that he was feeling tolerably well, adding that he'd feel still better if only he could be sure of being left in peace. Rio remarked that one couldn't always be alone. That's not what I meant. I was thinking of people who take an interest in you only to make trouble for you. When Rio said nothing, he went on. Mind you, that's not my case. Only, I've been reading that detective story. It's about a poor devil who's arrested one fine morning all of a sudden. People had been taking an interest in him, and he knew nothing about it. They were talking about him in offices, entering his name on card indexes. 
Now, do you think that's fair? Do you think people have a right to treat a man like that? Well, Rio said, that depends. In one sense, I agree, nobody has the right. But all that's beside the mark. What's important is for you to go out a bit. It's a mistake staying indoors too much. Cotard seemed vexed and said that, on the contrary, he was always going out, and, if need arose, all the people in the street could vouch for him. What's more, he knew lots of people in other parts of the town. Do you know Monsieur Rigaud, the architect? He's a friend of mine. I grant you it's only my theory. Still, in a sense, that goes for everybody. Throughout the day, the doctor was conscious that the slightly dazed feeling that came over him whenever he thought about the plague was growing more pronounced. Finally, he realized that he was afraid. On two occasions, he entered crowded cafes. Like Cotard, he felt a need for friendly contacts, human warmth. A stupid instinct, Rio told himself. Still, it served to remind him that he'd promised to visit the travelling salesman. Cotard was standing beside the dining table when the doctor entered his room that evening. A detective story lay open on the tablecloth, but the night was closing in and it would have been difficult to read in the growing darkness. Most likely Cotard had been sitting musing in the twilight until he heard the ring at his door. Ria asked how he was feeling. Cotard sat down and replied rather grumpily that he was feeling tolerably well, adding that he'd feel still better if only he could be sure of being left in peace. Rio remarked that one couldn't always be alone. That's not what I meant. I was thinking of people who take an interest in you only to make trouble for you. When Rio said nothing, he went on. Mind you, that's not my case. Only, I've been reading that detective story. It's about a poor devil who's arrested one fine morning all of a sudden. People had been taking an interest in him, and he knew nothing about it. They were talking about him in offices, entering his name on card indexes. Now, do you think that's fair? Do you think people have a right to treat a man like that? Well, Rio said, that depends. In one sense, I agree, nobody has the right. But all that's beside the mark. What's important is for you to go out a bit. It's a mistake staying indoors too much. Cotard seemed vexed and said that, on the contrary, he was always going out, and, if need arose, all the people in the street could vouch for him. What's more, he knew lots of people in other parts of the town. Do you know Monsieur Rigaud, the architect? He's a friend of mine. The room was in almost complete darkness. Outside, the street was growing noisier, and a sort of murmur of relief greeted the moment when all the street lamps lit up, all together. Rieu went out on the balcony, and Cotard followed him. From the outlying districts, as happens every evening in our town, a gentle breeze wafted a murmur of voices, smells of roasting meat, a gay, perfumed tide of freedom sounding on its way as the streets filled up with noisy young people released from shops and offices. Nightfall, with its deep, remote baying of unseen ships, the rumour rising from the sea and the happy tumult of the crowd, that first hour of darkness, which in the past had always had a special charm for Ryu, seemed today charged with menace, because of all he knew. How about turning on the lights, he suggested when they went back into the room. After this had been done, the little man gazed at him, blinking his eyes. Tell me, doctor. Suppose I fell ill, would you put me in your ward at the hospital? Why not? Cotard then inquired if it ever happened that a person in a hospital or a nursing home was arrested. Rio said it had been known to happen, but all depended on the invalid's condition. You know, doctor, Cotard said, I've confidence in you. Then he asked the doctor if he'd be kind enough to give him a lift as he was going into town. In the centre of the town, the streets were already growing less crowded and the lights fewer. Children were playing in front of the doorways. At Cotard's request, the doctor stopped his car beside one of the groups of children. They were playing hopscotch and making a great deal of noise. 
One of them, a boy with sleek, neatly parted hair and a grubby face, stared hard at Ryu with bright, bold eyes. The doctor looked away. Standing on the sidewalk, Cotard shook his head. He then said in a hoarse, rather laboured voice, casting uneasy glances over his shoulder, Everybody's talking about an epidemic. Is there anything in it, Doctor? People always talk, Rio replied. That's only to be expected. You're right, and if we have ten deaths, they'll think it's the end of the world. But it's not that we need here. The engine was ticking over. Rio had his hand on the clutch. But he was looking again at the boy who was still watching him with an oddly grave intentness. Suddenly, unexpectedly, the child smiled, showing all his teeth. Yes? And what do we need here? Rio asked, returning the child's smile. Abruptly, Cotard gripped the door of the car and, as he turned to go, almost shouted in a rageful, passionate voice, An earthquake! A big one! There was no earthquake, and the whole of the following day was spent, so far as Rio was concerned, in long drives to every corner of the town, in parleyangs with the families of the sick, and arguments with the invalids themselves. Never had Rio known his profession to weigh on him so heavily. Hitherto his patients had helped to lighten his task, they gladly put themselves into his hands. For the first time the doctor felt they were keeping aloof, wrapping themselves up in their malady with a sort of bemused hostility. It was a struggle to which he wasn't yet accustomed. And when, at ten that evening, he parked his car outside the home of his old asthma patient, his last visit of the day, it was an effort for Rieu to drag himself from his seat. For some moments he lingered, gazing up the dark street, watching the stars appear and disappear in the blackness of the sky. In the centre of the town, the streets were already growing less crowded and the lights fewer. Children were playing in front of the doorways. At Cotter's request, the doctor stopped his car beside one of the groups of children. They were playing hopscotch and making a great deal of noise. One of them, a boy with sleek, neatly parted hair and a grubby face, stared hard at Ryu with bright, bold eyes. The doctor looked away. Standing on the sidewalk, Cotard shook his head. He then said in a hoarse, rather laboured voice, casting uneasy glances over his shoulder, Everybody's talking about an epidemic. Is there anything in it, doctor? People always talk, Rio replied. That's only to be expected. You're right, and if we have ten deaths, they'll think it's the end of the world. But it's not that we need here. The engine was ticking over. Rio had his hand on the clutch. But he was looking again at the boy who was still watching him with an oddly grave intentness. Suddenly, unexpectedly, the child smiled, showing all his teeth. Yes? And what do we need here? Rio asked, returning the child's smile. Abruptly, Cotard gripped the door of the car and, as he turned to go, almost shouted in a rageful, passionate voice, An earthquake! A big one! There was no earthquake, and the whole of the following day was spent, so far as Rio was concerned, in long drives to every corner of the town, in parleyangs with the families of the sick, and arguments with the invalids themselves. Never had Rio known his profession to weigh on him so heavily. Hitherto his patients had helped to lighten his task, they gladly put themselves into his hands. For the first time the doctor felt they were keeping aloof, wrapping themselves up in their malady with a sort of bemused hostility. It was a struggle to which he wasn't yet accustomed. And when, at ten that evening, he parked his car outside the home of his old asthma patient, his last visit of the day, it was an effort for Rieu to drag himself from his seat. For some moments he lingered, gazing up the dark street, watching the stars appear and disappear in the blackness of the sky. When Rieu entered the room, the old man was sitting up in bed at his usual occupation, counting out dried peas from one pan to another. On seeing his visitor, he looked up, beaming with delight.
Well, Doctor, it's cholera, isn't it? Where on earth did you get that idea from? It's in the paper, and the radio said it too. No, it's not cholera. Anyhow, the old man chuckled excitedly, the big bugs are laying it on thick. Got the jitters, haven't they? Don't you believe a word of it, the doctor said. He had examined the old man and now was sitting in the middle of the dingy little dining room. Yes, despite what he had said, he was afraid. He knew that in this suburb alone, eight or ten unhappy people, cowering over their buboes, would be awaiting his visit next morning. In only two or three cases had incision of the buboes caused any improvement. For most of them, it would mean going to the hospital, and he knew how poor people feel about hospitals. I don't want them trying their experiments on him, had said the wife of one of his patients. But he wouldn't be experimented on. He would die. That was all. That the regulations now in force were inadequate was lamentably clear. As for the specially equipped wards, he knew what they amounted to. Two outbuildings from which the other patients had been hastily evacuated, whose windows had been hermetically sealed and round which a sanitary cordon had been set. The only hope was that the outbreak would die a natural death. It certainly wouldn't be arrested by the measures the authorities had so far devised. Nevertheless, that night the official communique was still optimistic. On the following day, Ransdok announced that the rules laid down by the local administration had won general approval, and already thirty sick persons had reported. Castel rang up Rieu. How many beds are there in the special wards? Eighty. Surely there are far more than thirty cases in the town? Don't forget there are two sorts of cases, those who take fright and those, they're the majority, who don't have time to do so. I see. Are they checking up on the burials? No. I told Richard over the phone that energetic measures were needed, not just words. We'd got to set up a real barrier against the disease, otherwise we might just as well do nothing. Yes. And what did he say? Nothing doing. He hadn't the powers. In my opinion, it's going to get worse. That was so. Within three days, both wards were full. According to Richard, there was talk of requisitioning a school and opening an auxiliary hospital. Meanwhile, Rio continued incising buboes and waiting for the anti-plague serum. Castell went back to his old books and spent long hours in the public library. Those rats died of plague, was his conclusion, or of something extremely like it, and they've loosed on the town tens of thousands of fleas which will spread the infection in geometrical progression unless it's checked in time. Ryu said nothing. About this time, the weather appeared set fair, and the sun had drawn up the last puddles left by the recent rain. There was a serene blue sky flooded with golden light each morning, with sometimes a drone of planes in the rising heat. All seemed well with the world. And yet within four days, the fever had made four startling strides, sixteen deaths, twenty-four, twenty-eight, and thirty-two. On the fourth day, the opening of the auxiliary hospital in the premises of a primary school was officially announced. The local population, who so far had made a point of masking their anxiety by facetious comments, now seemed tongue-tied and went their ways with gloomy faces. Rius decided to ring up the prefect. The regulations don't go anywhere near far enough. Yes, the prefect replied. I've seen the statistics and, as you say, they're most perturbing. They're more than perturbing. They're conclusive. I'll ask government for orders. When Rio next met Castel, the prefect's remark was still rankling. Orders, he said scornfully when what's needed is imagination. Any news of the serum? It'll come this week. The prefect sent instructions to Ryu through Richard, asking him to draw up a minute to be transmitted for orders to the central administration of the colony. Ryu's included in it a clinical diagnosis and statistics of the epidemic. On that day, 40 deaths were reported.
The prefect took the responsibility, as he put it, of tightening up the new regulations. Compulsory declaration of all cases of fever and their isolation were to be strictly enforced. The residences of sick people were to be shut up and disinfected. Persons living in the same house were to go into quarantine. Burials were to be supervised by the local authorities, in a manner which will be described later on. Next day the serum arrived by plane. There was enough for immediate requirements, but not enough if the epidemic were to spread. In reply to his telegram, Rio was informed that the emergency reserve stock was exhausted, but that a new supply was in preparation. Meanwhile, from all the outlying districts, spring was making its progress into the town. Thousands of roses wilted in the flower vendors' baskets in the marketplaces and along the streets, and the air was heavy with their cloying perfume. Outwardly, indeed, this spring was like any other. The streetcars were always packed at the rush hours, empty and untidy during the rest of the day. Taro watched the little man and the little old man spat on the cats. Grand hurried home every evening to his mysterious literary activities. Cotard went his usual desultory ways, and M. Othon, the magistrate, continued to parade his menagerie. The old Spaniard decanted his dried peas from pan to pan, and sometimes you encountered Rambert, the journalist, looking interested as ever in all he saw. In the evening, the usual crowd thronged the streets and the lines lengthened outside the picture houses. Moreover, the epidemic seemed to be on the wane. On some days, only ten or so deaths were notified. Then, all of a sudden, the figure shot up again, vertically. On the day when the death roll touched thirty, Dr. Rio read an official telegram that the prefect had just handed him, remarking, So they've got alarmed at last. The telegram ran, proclaim a state of plague stop, close the town. From now on, it can be said that plague was the concern of all of us. Hitherto, surprised as he may have been by the strange things happening around him, each individual citizen had gone about his business as usual, so far as this was possible, and no doubt he would have continued doing so. But once the town gates were shut, every one of us realised that all, the narrator included, were, so to speak, in the same boat, and each would have to adapt himself to the new conditions of life. Thus, for example, a feeling normally as individual as the ache of separation from those one loves suddenly became a feeling in which all shared alike and, together with fear, the greatest affliction of the long period of exile that lay ahead. One of the most striking consequences of the closing of the gates was, in fact, this sudden deprivation befalling people who were completely unprepared for it. Mothers and children, lovers, husbands and wives, who had a few days previously taken it for granted that their parting would be a short one, who had kissed one another goodbye on the platform and exchanged a few trivial remarks, sure as they were of seeing one another again after a few days or, at most, a few weeks, duped by our blind human faith in the near future and little if at all, diverted from their normal interests by this leave-taking. All these people found themselves, without the least warning, hopelessly cut off, prevented from seeing one another again, or even communicating with one another. For actually, the closing of the gates took place some hours before the official order was made known to the public, and, naturally enough, it was impossible to take individual cases of hardship into account. It might indeed be said that the first effect of this brutal visitation was to compel our townspeople to act as if they had no feelings as individuals. During the first part of the day on which the prohibition to leave the town came into force, the prefect's office was besieged by a crowd of applicants advancing pleas of equal cogency but equally impossible to take into consideration. Indeed, it needed several days for us to realise that we were completely cornered that words like special arrangements, favour and priority had lost all effective meaning. Even the small satisfaction of writing letters was denied us. It came to this, 
Not only had the town ceased to be in touch with the rest of the world by normal means of communication, but also, according to a second notification, all correspondence was forbidden to obviate the risk of letters carrying infection outside the town. In the early days, a favoured few managed to persuade the sentries at the gates to allow them to get messages through to the outside world. But that was only at the beginning of the epidemic, when the sentries found it natural to obey their feelings of humanity. Later on, when these same sentries had had the gravity of the situation drummed into them, they flatly refused to take responsibilities whose possible after-effects they could not foresee. At first, telephone calls to other towns were allowed, but this led to such crowding of the telephony booths and delays on the lines that for some days they also were prohibited and thereafter limited to what were called urgent cases such as deaths, marriages and births. So we had to fall back on telegrams, people linked together by friendship. Affection, or physical love, found themselves reduced to hunting for tokens of their past communion within the compass of a ten-word telegram. And since, in practice, the phrases one can use in a telegram are quickly exhausted, long lives passed side by side, or passionate yearnings, soon declined to the exchange of such trite formulas as am well, always thinking of you, love. Some few of us, however, persisted in writing letters and gave much time to hatching plans for corresponding with the outside world. But almost always these plans came to nothing. Even on the rare occasions when they succeeded, we could not know this, since we received no answer. For weeks on end, we were reduced to starting the same letter over and over again, recopying the same scraps of news and the same personal appeals, with the result that, after a certain time, the living words into which we had, as it were, transfused our heart's blood were drained of any meaning. Thereafter we went on copying them mechanically, trying, through the dead phrases, to convey some notion of our ordeal and in the long run to these sterile, reiterated monologues, these futile colloquies with a blank wall, even the banal formulas of a telegram came to seem preferable. Also, after some days, when it was clear that no one had the least hope of being able to leave our town, inquiries began to be made whether the return of people who had gone away before the outbreak would be permitted. After some days' consideration of the matter, the authorities replied affirmatively. They pointed out, however, that in no case would persons who returned be allowed to leave the town again. Once here, they would have to stay, whatever happened. Some families, actually very few, refused to take the position seriously and, in their eagerness to have the absent members of the family with them again, cast prudence to the winds and wired to them to take this opportunity of returning. But very soon, those who were prisoners of the plague realised the terrible danger to which this would expose their relatives, and sadly resigned themselves to their absence. At the height of the epidemic, we saw only one case in which natural emotions overcame the fear of death in a particularly painful form. It was not, as might be expected, the case of two young people whose passion made them yearn for each other's nearness at whatever cost of pain. The two were old Dr. Castell and his wife, and they had been married for very many years. Madame Castell had gone on a visit to a neighbouring town some days before the epidemic started. They weren't one of those exemplary married couples of the Darby and Joan pattern. On the contrary, the narrator has grounds for saying that, in all probability, neither partner felt quite sure the marriage was all that could have been desired but this ruthless, protracted separation enabled them to realise that they could not live apart, and in the sudden glow of this discovery, the risk of plague seemed insignificant. That was an exception. For most people, it was obvious that the separation must last until the end of the epidemic, and for every one of us, the ruling emotion of his life, which he had imagined he knew through and through, the people of Oran, as has been said, have simple passions, took on a new aspect. 
Husbands who had had complete faith in their wives found to their surprise that they were jealous. And lovers had the same experience. Men who had pictured themselves as Don Juans became models of fidelity. Sons who had lived beside their mothers, hardly giving them a glance, fell to picturing with poignant regret each wrinkle in the absent face that memory cast upon the screen. This drastic, clean-cut deprivation and our complete ignorance of what the future held in store had taken us unawares. We were unable to react against the mute appeal of presences, still so near and already so far, which haunted us day long. In fact, our suffering was twofold, our own to start with, and then the imagined suffering of the absent one, son, mother, wife, or mistress. Under other circumstances, our townsfolk would probably have found an outlet in increased activity, a more sociable life. But the plague forced inactivity on them, limiting their movements to the same dull round inside the town, and throwing them, day after day, on the elusive solace of their memories. For in their aimless walks, they kept on coming back to the same streets, and usually, owing to the smallness of the town, these were streets in which, in happier days, they had walked with those who now were absent. Thus, the first thing that plague brought to our town was exile. And the narrator is convinced that he can set down here, as holding good for all, the feeling he personally had and to which many of his friends confessed. It was undoubtedly the feeling of exile that sensation of a void within which never left us, that irrational longing to hark back to the past or else to speed up the march of time, and those keen shafts of memory that stung like fire. Sometimes we toyed with our imagination, composing ourselves to wait for a ring at the bell announcing somebody's return, or for the sound of a familiar footstep on the stairs. But, Though we might deliberately stay at home at the hour when a traveller coming by the evening train would normally have arrived, and though we might contrive to forget for the moment that no trains were running, that game of make-believe, for obvious reasons, could not last. Always a moment came when we had to face the fact that no trains were coming in. And then we realised that the separation was destined to continue. We had no choice but to come to terms with the days ahead. In short, we returned to our prison house. We had nothing left us but the past. And even if some were tempted to live in the future, they had speedily to abandon the idea, anyhow, as soon as could be, once they felt the wounds that the imagination inflicts on those who yield themselves to it. It is noteworthy that our townspeople very quickly desisted, even in public, from a habit one might have expected them to form, that of trying to figure out the probable duration of their exile. The reason was this. When the most pessimistic had fixed it at, say, six months, when they had drunk in advance the dregs of bitterness of those six black months and painfully screwed up their courage to the sticking place, straining all their remaining energy to endure valiantly the long ordeal of all those weeks and days. When they had done this, some friend they met, an article in a newspaper, a vague suspicion, or a flash of foresight, would suggest that, after all, there was no reason why the epidemic shouldn't last more than six months. Why not a year, or even more? At such moments, the collapse of their courage, willpower, and endurance was so abrupt that they felt they could never drag themselves out of the pit of despond into which they had fallen. Therefore they forced themselves never to think about the problematic day of escape, to cease looking to the future, and always to keep, so to speak, their eyes fixed on the ground at their feet. But naturally enough, this prudence, this habit of fainting with their predicament, and refusing to put up a fight, was ill-rewarded. For while averting that revulsion which they found so unbearable, they also deprived themselves of those redeeming moments, frequent enough when all is told, when by conjuring up pictures of a reunion to be, they could forget about the plague. Thus, in a middle course between these heights and depths, they drifted through life rather than lived, 
the prey of aimless days and sterile memories, like wandering shadows that could have acquired substance only by consenting to root themselves in the solid earth of their distress. Thus, too, they came to know the incorrigible sorrow of all prisoners and exiles, which is to live in company with a memory that serves no purpose. Even the past, of which they thought incessantly, had a savour only of regret. For they would have wished to add to it all that they regretted having left undone, while they might yet have done it, with the man or woman whose return they now awaited. Just as in all the activities, even the relatively happy ones, of their life as prisoners, they kept vainly trying to include the absent one. And thus there was always something missing in their lives. Hostile to the past, impatient of the present, and cheated of the future, we were much like those whom men's justice or hatred forces to live behind prison bars. Thus the only way of escaping from that intolerable leisure was to set the trains running again in one's imagination and in filling the silence with the fancied tinkle of a doorbell in practice obstinately mute. Still, if it was an exile, it was, for most of us, exile in one's own home. And though the narrator experienced only the common form of exile, he cannot forget the case of those who, like Rambert, the journalist, and a good many others, had to endure an aggravated deprivation, since, being travellers, caught by the plague, and forced to stay where they were, they were cut off both from the person with whom they wanted to be, and from their homes as well. In the general exile, they were the most exiled, since while time gave rise for them, as for us all, to the suffering appropriate to it, there was also for them the space factor. They were obsessed by it, and at every moment knocked their heads against the walls of this huge and alien lazar house, secluding them from their lost homes. These were the people, no doubt, whom one often saw wandering forlornly in the dusty town at all hours of the day, silently invoking nightfalls known to them alone and the daysprings of their happier land and they fed their despondency with fleeting intimations, messages as disconcerting as a flight of swallows, a dewfall at sundown, or those queer glints the soon, sometimes daplies on empty streets. As for that outside world, which can always offer an escape from everything, they shut their eyes to it, bent as they were on cherishing the all-too-real phantoms of their imagination, and conjuring up with all their might Pictures of a land where a special play of light, two or three hills, a favourite tree, a woman's smile, composed for them a world that nothing could replace. To come at last, and more specifically, to the case of parted lovers who present the greatest interest and of whom the narrator is, perhaps, better qualified to speak. Their minds were the prey of different emotions, notably remorse for their present position enabled them to take stock of their feelings with a sort of feverish objectivity. And in these conditions it was rare for them not to detect their own shortcomings. What first brought these home to them was the trouble they experienced in summoning up any clear picture of what the absent one was doing. They came to deplore their ignorance of the way in which that person used to spend his or her days and reproach themselves for having troubled too little about this in the past, and for having affected to think that, for a lover, the occupations of the loved one, when they are not together, could be a matter of indifference and not a source of joy. Once this had been brought home to them, they could retrace the course of their love and see where it had fallen short. In normal times, all of us know, whether consciously or not, that there is no love which can't be bettered. Nevertheless, we reconcile ourselves more or less easily to the fact that ours has never risen above the average. But memory is less disposed to compromise. And in a very definite way, this misfortune which had come from outside and befallen a whole town did more than inflict on us an unmerited distress, with which we might well be indignant. It also incited us to create our own suffering and thus to accept frustration as a natural state. 
This was one of the tricks the pestilence had of diverting attention and confounding issues. Thus each of us had to be content to live only for the day, alone under the vast indifference of the sky. This sense of being abandoned, which might in time have given characters a finer temper, began, however, by sapping them to the point of futility. For instance, some of our fellow citizens became subject to a curious kind of servitude, which put them at the mercy of the sun and the rain. Looking at them, you had an impression that for the first time in their lives, they were becoming, as some would say, weather conscious. A burst of sunshine was enough to make them seem delighted with the world, while rainy days gave a dark cast to their faces and their mood. A few weeks before, they had been free of this absurd subservience to the weather, because they had not to face life alone. The person they were living with held, to some extent, the foreground of their little world. But from now on it was different. They seemed at the mercy of the sky's caprices. In other words, suffered and hoped irrationally. Moreover, in this extremity of solitude, none could count on any help from his neighbour. Each had to bear the load of his troubles alone. If, by some chance, one of us tried to unburden himself or to say something about his feelings, the reply he got, whatever it might be, usually wounded him. And then it dawned on him that he and the man with him weren't talking about the same thing. For while he himself spoke from the depths of long days of brooding upon his personal distress, and the image he had tried to impart had been slowly shaped and proved in the fires of passion and regret. This meant nothing to the man to whom he was speaking, who pictured a conventional emotion, a grief that is traded on the marketplace, mass-produced. Whether friendly or hostile, the reply always missed fire, and the attempt to communicate had to be given up. This was true of those at least for whom silence was unbearable, and since the others could not find the truly expressive word, they resigned themselves to using the current coin of language, the commonplaces of plain narrative, of anecdote, and of their daily paper. So in these cases, too, even the sincerest grief had to make do with the set phrases of ordinary conversation. Only on these terms could the prisoners of the plague ensure the sympathy of their concierge and the interest of their hearers. Nevertheless, and this point is most important, However bitter their distress, and however heavy their hearts, for all their emptiness, it can be truly said of these exiles that in the early period of the plague they could account themselves privileged. For at the precise moment when the residents of the town began to panic, their thoughts were wholly fixed on the person whom they longed to meet again. The egoism of love made them immune to the general distress, and, if they thought of the plague, it was only in so far as it might threaten to make their separation eternal. Thus, in the very heart of the epidemic, they maintained a saving indifference, which one was tempted to take for composure. Their despair saved them from panic. Thus, their misfortune had a good side. For instance, if it happened that one of them was carried off by the disease, it was almost always without his having had time to realise it. Snatched suddenly from his long, silent communion with a wraith of memory, he was plunged straightway into the densest silence of all. He'd had no time for anything. 